So welcome to Unit 9, Developmental Psychology. Um, if you're just joining this channel, the, today's lecture will correspond to Meyer Psychology for the AP Course 3rd Edition. And today we're going to be going over Module 45, Developmental Issues, Prenatal Development in the Newborn. As you can see, there's quite a few modules in Developmental Psychology that we'll be going through. So the learning targets for today, what things should you understand at the end of this module? You should be able to identify three issues that have engaged developmental psychologists, these three big ideas that are pervasive throughout the field of developmental psychology. The second one, you should be able to discuss the course of prenatal development and explain how teratogens affect development. You should be able to describe some abilities of the newborn and explain how researchers are able to explore infant mental abilities. So what is developmental psychology? Well, it's like most of the things we've been discussing in this, in this class. Um, a it's a branch of psychology. It's one component of psychology that studies physical, cognitive, and social change throughout the lifespan. And I think what's important to remember, oftentimes we think about developmental psychology and we often think about childhood. But researchers who study developmental psychology are actually studying how we change physically, cognitively, and socially throughout our entire lifespan. The three issues, and these are three big issues that there are still so many questions about within the field of developmental psychology. The first one pretty much pervades every um, topic area within this course, nature and nurture. How does our genetic inheritance, our nature, interact with our nurture, our experiences to influences who we develop into? Big, 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 big question um, in terms of our physical, social, and cognitive development. Continuity and stages. We're going to be talking about lots of different psychologists who have done research and come up with profound theories, and some of them are more stage theorists and some of them believe more in sort of a continuity of development. So what does that mean? What parts of development are gradual <clears throat> and continuous and what parts change sort of abruptly and it's almost like we become we go into different stages. And then finally the third big issue is stability and change. Which of our traits that make us who we are sort of persist throughout our life and which ones actually change as we age. So if you are taking the AP exam, here's a tip from the um, textbook publishers. All three of the issues that were just discussed, right? The nature versus nurture, the stage, stages versus continuity, and the stability and change. Those are three issues that are important for development. And kind of being able to wrap your head around what those mean is very important. Nature and nurture is, of course, probably one of the, the, the most talked about things in this course, and it weaves its way throughout basically every module within this course. You should be prepared to understand how to, you know, um, conceptualize the nature versus nurture issue as applied to many different domains that we've studied within this course. So how do genes, our genetics, form our nature? The gene combination created by the merging of our mother's egg and our father's sperm helps form us as individuals. So genes predispose both our shared humanity and our individual differences. But what about our environment? How does it shape our nurture? But our experiences also form us in the womb and in the world. So right there is really important to think about. I think oftentimes we um, consider environmental influence on um, a child or a human being after they've been born. But actually, there are a lot of environmental influences that can affect our development even within the womb, okay? Even differences rooted in our nature, our genetics, may be strengthened by our nurture, our environment. We are not formed by either nature or nurture, but most, most psychologists believe that it is a combination of their interaction, the interrelationships between nature and nurture. Biological, psychological, and sociocultural forces interact. 
So does growth, that development happen continuously or in stages? This is an important thing to consider and this example is a great way to conceptualize it. Do adults differ from infants as a giant redwood differs from its seedling, a difference created by gradual cumulative growth, or do they differ as a butterfly differs from a caterpillar, a difference of distinct stages? And we're gonna talk about different theorists who had different ideas about this. So if you think about the redwood example, the differences are generally quantitative, right? It's just as we grow, we're getting bigger. You know, we're, we're not changing fundamentally um, in profound ways, we're just gaining more knowledge, experiences, all that was just growing us and make us, making us turn into a larger redwood, right? On the other hand, the caterpillar butterfly example <clears throat> suggests that perhaps infants and then children it, it go through different stages where they're fundamentally different and they think about and look at and view um, and encounter the world in fundamentally different ways than adults. It's not just a quantitative difference, it's actually also a qualitative difference. The way they approach the world is qualitatively different. So how do stage theorists tend to view development? And here are three stage theorists that are very famous and you should be aware of their names. Lawrence Kohlberg, who studied moral development, Eric Erickson, who studied psychosocial development, and probably the most famous developmental psychologist of all time, Jean Piaget, who is best known for his study of cognitive development. And we're gonna go into each of these, um, uh, these people more in depth. But right now, what I want you to understand is that stage theorists emphasize biological maturation as a sequence of genetically predisposed stages or steps. Think about it as steps, like a picture of steps going up. That you're kind of, it's not just that you're going up a smooth hill, it's that there's some change with each step that you go up. It's fundamentally different than the step before. Although progress through the various stages may be quick or slow, everyone passes through the stages in the same order. Another really important point, like when we're gonna be talking about Piaget, even though some people are gonna get through the stages much more quickly than others, they're gonna go through those stages in that order. Um, and so that's something to think about in terms of what it means for stage development. There are not gonna be any steps that are skipped, but some people do progress through the steps much more quickly than others. So what evidence supports the theory of stable development over time? One research team that studied a thousand people from ages three to 38 was struck by the consistency of temper temperament and emotionality across time. Out of control three-year-olds were the most likely to become teen smokers, adult criminals, or out of control gamblers, right? So that seems like there's a bit of continuity based on that, those studies. Um, how about some additional research on nature versus nurture? In another study, six-year-old Canadian boys with conduct problems at age six were four times more likely than other boys to be convicted of a violent crime by age 24. Mm. Now, hopefully you're reading some of these um, research results and thinking, well, okay, that's interesting, but I need more information to look at the study, you know, what exactly did they evaluate? But interesting information to take into account. Can temperament predict divorce? In one longitudinal study of 306 college um, alums, one in four with yearbook expressions like the one on the left was later divorced as compared to one in 20 that had bigger you know, smiles that may be more of a sign of a certain type of temperament. So that's a really fascinating study. Um, but again, we need to think about all of these results within um, context of all the information we have. One study, doesn't make us know everything, right? Um, we need lots of replication. So are people's personalities mostly stable over time? As at seven, so as 70, says a Jewish proverb. proverb. People predict that they will not change much in the future. And in some ways they're right. As people grow older, personality seems to gradually stabilize. But we do change too. Our social attitudes, for example, are much less stable than our temperament, especially during those impressionable late adolescent years. Older children and adolescents learn new ways of coping. Although delinquent children have elevated rates of later problems, many confused and troubled children blossom into mature, successful adults, all right? As we once were doesn't mean that's the only way we can be. There are lots of factors involved. 
So life requires both stability and change. Stability provides our identity, enabling us to depend on others and on ourselves. Our potential for change gives us our hope for a brighter future. And then we can adapt and grow with our experiences, right? So it's this combination of stability and change. Almost every topic in psychology um, has personal relevance, right? We can, that's the awesome, the awesomeness of psychology, right? We can apply it to ourselves all the time. So as you work your way through this unit, think how the material relates to you, your relatives, and your friends. And like, you know, at, are you different than you once were? Um, do, you, do you have parents or older adults in your life that talk about, you know, the way they once were? And you are surprised based on knowing who they are now, okay? So as you learned in module 31, making the material personally meaningful is one of those tips that we have to make it, you strengthen those connections and enable and enhance your later recall of the information. So what is the course of prenatal development? So life begins at conception and continues through several stages in the womb, right? And you can see these images, you've probably seen some similar in other textbooks. How does conception occur? The path to life begins with the release of an egg from the mother's ovary. 250 million deposited sperm approach an egg cell. 85,000 times their own size, the number, the small number reaching the egg release digestive en enzymes that eat away the egg's protective coating. One sperm penetrates the coating and enters through the egg surface, blocking out the other sperm. Within hours, the egg nucleus and the sperm nucleus fuse. The two become one. So what happens in the germinal stage of prenatal development? The germinal stage is the first 10 days to two weeks of development is when the fertilized egg called a zygote undergoes rapid cell division. One cell becomes two, then four, each just like the first until the cell division produces about 100 identical cells within the first week. The cells then begin to differentiate, to specialize in structure and function, to become brain tissue, intestine tissue, heart tissue, etc. About 10 days after conception, the germinal stage completes as the zygote attaches to the mother's uterine wall inside her uterus, beginning at approximately 37 weeks, beginning, sorry, the, the 37 weeks of the closest, physically closest human relationship possible, right? A healthy and well-nourished mother helps form a healthy baby to be. Over the next six weeks, the embryo's organs begin to form and function and the heart begins to beat. How does the zygote become an embryo? The zygote's inner cells become an embryo. Many of its outer cells become the placenta, which is the life link that transfers nutrients and oxygen from the mother to the embryo, okay? By nine weeks after conception, an embryo begins to look unmistakably hum human. It is now called a fetus. During the sixth month, organs such as the stomach develop enough to give the fetus a good chance of surviving and thriving if born prematurely. What happens at the fetal stage? By the start of the ninth week, when the fetal period begins, facial features, hands, and feet have formed. As the fetus enters the 16th week, it's three ounces could fit in the palm of your hand. So here's a little bit of information about what research shows about the development of language in the, in the womb, really fascinating stuff. After repeatedly hearing a fake word in the womb, Finnish newborns brain waves displayed recognition when hearing the word afterbirth. So what moms are saying, what people around dads are saying, what people around the pregnant woman are saying actually seems to be being heard in some way. If their mother spoke two languages during pregnancy, newborns display interest in both. And just after birth, the melodic ups and downs of newborns cries bear the tuneful signature of their mother's native tongue. So teratogens, what are those? They are literally that word translates into monster makers. They're agents such as chemicals and viruses that can reach the embryo or fetus during prenatal development and cause harm. Some examples of teratogens that are very problematic um, to uh, you know, a developing baby 
are alcohol consumption by the mother, tobacco use, drugs, cocaine, meth, etc., viruses, right? Things that uh, a mother could be exposed to that are viruses in the environment and certain medications can also have a significantly negative effect. How does alcohol have an effect on the fetus? So <laughs> this quote here um, tells you historically kind of what has been thought even before we had science to let us know, right? You shall conceive and bear a son, so then drink no wine. So it was known from a long time ago that probably drinking alcohol when pregnant was not a good idea. Um, when a pregnant woman, if, if a pregnant woman does smoke or drink, it's never alone. When alcohol enters the bloodstream and th then it enters the fetus, it reduces activity in both of their central nervous systems. What, are the, what could be the implications of this? Alcohol use during pregnancy may prime the woman's offspring to like alcohol and put them at risk for heavy drinking and alcohol use disorder in their teen, teen years. In experiments, when pregnant rats drank alcohol, their young offspring later displayed a liking for alcohol's taste and odor. Even light drinking or occasional binge drinking can affect the fetal brain, right? So there is no information for scientists to know that even a little bit of alcohol is okay during any evidence that I know of, that a little bit of alcohol is okay during pregnancy. Persistent heavy drinking for sure puts the fetus at risk for a dangerously low birth weight, birth defects, future behavior problems, and lower intelligence. For one in about 700 children, the effects are visible, and this is known as fetal alcohol syndrome or FAS. It's the most serious of all fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, marked by lifelong physical and mental abnormalities. So switching gears a little bit, what are some of the adaptive reflexes that the newborn is equipped with? What are they born with? What, what can babies do when they're born? Very interesting stuff. When something touches a newborn's cheek, babies turn toward that touch, open their mouth, and vigorously root, it's called rooting, for a nipple. Finding one, they automatically close on it and began sucking. Other adaptive reflexes include the startle reflex, when arms and legs spring out, quickly followed by fist clenching and loud crying, and the surprisingly strong grasping reflex of a newborn, both of which may have helped infants, think about this from ev an evolutionarily adaptive sort of mechanism, these things may have helped infants to stay close to their caregivers. So here's a chart I'll leave on here for a second. I'm not gonna read all of this. Um, just to get an idea of what the rooting, sucking, grasping, star startle, or moral reflex, and the Binsky reflex are. I can clearly remember um, our two sons uh, <laughs> Uh, and seeing these reflexes happen soon after birth. And it's just amazing. It's just amazing to witness. Maybe some of you have with younger siblings. Okay, what is habituation and how is it used to study infants? So habituation is decreasing responsiveness with repeated stimulation. As infants gain familiarity with repeated exposure to a stimulus, their interest wanes and they look away sooner. Okay, so the novel stimulus gets attention when first presented, but with repetition, the response weakens. They habituate to it. This, it's sort of like boredom. The seeming boredom with familiar stimuli gives us a way to ask infants what they see and remember, right? Because you can't just ask a new baby, uh, do you remember seeing this picture of a dog, right? They won't remember. So uh, developmental psychologists have developed this fascinating technique to be able to understand if, um, babies do recognize something. So it's really, really, uh, really cool research going on with habituation. So now we're back to the learning target review. The learning target review. The first learning target for this module was to be able to identify three issues that have engaged developmental psychologists. These are big ideas that are really important. important. So developmental psychologists study physical, mental, and social change throughout the lifespan, not just in childhood. The three big issues they focus on are nature and nurture, continuity and stages, and stability and change, right? The contribution and the interaction between genes and our environment, um, understanding which aspects of development are gradual, 
be continuous and which change relatively abruptly and look more like a completely different stage. And then stability and change, whether our traits endure or we change as we age. So understanding a little bit about prenatal development and, and the teratogens that can affect prenatal development is important. The life cycle begins at conception when one sperm cell unites with an egg to form a zygote. The zygote's inner cells become the embryo, and in the next six weeks, body organs begin to form and function. By nine weeks, the fetus, you may have heard some of these terms, the fetus is recognizably human. Teratogens are problematic and potentially harmful agents, such as viruses or drugs, that can pass through the placental screen. Remember that placenta is how the, the baby is connected to um, its mother and harm the developing embryo or fetus, as happens with fetal alcohol syndrome. What are some abilities that the newborns have? And newborns do have abilities. They're like these innate capacities. Babies are born with sensory equipment and reflexes that facilitate their survival and their social interactions with adults. For example, they quickly learn to discriminate their mother's smell and they prefer the sound of human voices. Researchers and developmental psychologists use tests of habituation such as the visual preference procedure to explore infants' abilities. So thank you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.